Honey, you've got, you've got something on your face. Mom. Did you brush your teeth? Did you really brush your teeth? Let me smell your breath. Mom! Hey, okay, Jake, honey, this is the only thing I can find, all right? <laughs> Mom! Yeah, it's a compound fracture. <sighs> I'm sorry, sweetheart. You're gonna be okay. Mom? Well, you have a good set of crutches? Seriously, Jake, what am I going to do with you? Mom. Hi, Jake. Hi. Ooh, she's really cute. Mom. Mom? Mom. Jake, sit up straight, honey. Mom. something on your face. Mom. Man, on behalf of everybody who is alive in this room, we're grateful for moms because without them, we wouldn't be alive, right? Uh, that's the first thing. But we're, we're um, I think, um, responsible to take an opportunity, specifically one time a year on Mother's Day, to really just focus on thanking God for the, the very unique role that He's given you in our lives. And, and so, um, man, on behalf of everybody um, happy mother's day and if you're a mom you're you're precious uh, to us and we're grateful that uh, god's given you to us and so thank you for all the investments that you make um, and so go ahead and look even if, it, if it's a guy find a find somebody that's a mom real quick all right and say happy mother's day to them real quick go and find them real quick say happy mother's day happy mother's day all right Go and take your Bibles and look at um, Psalm 127. Psalm chapter 127 is a passage. We're going to kind of dive into the idea of parenting today. We started a new series, Family Matters, last week. And we began by talking about love and marriage. And uh, if you missed it, quick summary is basically that God's the one who came up with love. He's the one who created us. He created um, man and woman. He basically established uh, the institution of marriage, and he's the one who actually has the right as God to impose any standard he wants to on us as his creation. And uh, again, that's not a real popular thing in our culture, our, our society today, but from a person of faith, I don't really know how we get confused sometimes and think that God doesn't have the right to tell us what to do. I mean, I'm just, you know, just again, being real uh, um, straightforward, uh, rebellion does lead us to try to do our own things. And hey, parenting <laughs> is relevant to this. We understand. Man, a tendency of a child is to definitely do, it, I guess, any, anything contrary to the instructions they're giving. But that's rebellion. But somehow with God, we don't see it the same way. But see, a parent has the right, has full right to impose any standard on the child that they deem appropriate. In the same way, God, even more so, our sovereign God, has a full right to tell me what He expects and what the standard is from me as a dad and as a husband. 
That's his right. Now, I can choose to deviate from his standard, but I will pay the consequences. And so that's just a simple foundational thing. Last week we talked about love and marriage and how God created all that, and, and it's not our place really to, uh, to deviate from his standard. It's his standard. Today we're going to talk about parenting because here's the reality. Parenting is not easy. No matter if you do it right or wrong, it's going to be challenging. It, it's, it, you know, I guess obeying God and yielding to God as a parent, surrendering your family to God as a parent, dedicating your children, not just in a ceremony, but really truthfully with your whole heart, committing them to Christ. See, that, that, that is a big deal, but it's also just a step in the right direction. You see, commitment to Christ doesn't make parenting easy. And there's no parent in this room that's going to say they've got it all together. No mom and no dad is going to ever say that they're, they're the perfect mom or the perfect dad. Uh, we all make mistakes. We all fail God. We all fall short. But, but it, I think from a, just uh, starting from the right perspective, we need to make sure we're starting right and that some, some general principles of parenting we can glean from this passage in Psalm 127 will really help us. And I, I would say this, if you're a new parent or a, um, you have basically beginning your family, you have the opportunity to start a lot of this right. It's much harder to correct things midstream. Doesn't mean you can't do it. It's just more difficult. Again, because you have created your own standard. And there's actually there, there, there's a pattern that your children have even gotten used to. And if you're a parent, you already understand this because there's times where you, you've had it right and you've, you've maybe dropped the ball and you have to go back and course correct midstream. Well, this is one of those times. It may be that you are later on in life and you're able to invest in others and maybe offer some of this scriptural advice to them. Maybe you're in here today and you're saying, I'm a single uh, person. I, I don't even, I'm not married. I don't have kids. How does this apply to me? I think you're going to see a lot of these principles are applicable to us no matter where we are. Students in high school, um, in elementary school, all the way to a single adult. These things are very relevant to all of us in every, in every area of our life. So let's go and look at uh, Psalm 127. And we're looking today at crazy good parents. We want to be, obviously, I think every child will probably say at some point in time, their parents got the crazy part right, right? But we want to be not just crazy parents. We want to be crazy good parents. We want to be awesome parents. We want to be parents that God's pleased with. That he looks at us and he says, you know what, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, proud of the investment that you're making in your children's lives. Psalm chapter 127, here we go, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with, uh, with sentries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat. For God gives rest to his loved ones. Look at verse 3. Children are a gift from the Lord. Would you say it with me? Children are a gift from the Lord. So God gives them to us. They are a reward from him. And verse 4 says, children born to a young man, we could definitely say young man and young woman, are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man or woman whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. So we see here in this passage, Psalm 127, just a short five verses, but we see a lot of content and here's what I'm going to give you. We're going, to, we're going to make five general principles from the Scripture. But then I want to also give you three practical applications about crazy good parents. So it's going to basically be six points, but they're, they're different. Three of them are just general principles we're going to draw right out of the text. And then the other three applications are relevant to those points. But, um, but I think it'll make sense as we walk through. First of all, I want you to see, in verse 1, our best work is wasted without God's help. Our best work is wasted without God's help. And I promised this a moment ago. Even if you're not a parent, you get this, all right? Your best work is wasted without God's help. If you're a student, your best work is wasted without God's help. If you're a single adult who's looking for the love of your life, your best work is wasted without God's help. You could do your best, and it's not going to be enough if you don't let God work through you. And that's just a simple principle but it's a biblical principle. Look at verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, the work of the builders is wasted. 
And you may have an expectation and a plan in your life. You may have it all mapped out. You've got it together, and you're just like, man, I've, I'm doing this, right? And you're mapping it out, and you're going, and you're meeting the expectations. You're climbing the ladder, whatever it looks like. But here's what I'm here to tell you. You can work all you want to work. If you don't let God lead you, you are going to eventually fail. You're going to fail. But why? Because unless the Lord builds the house, the work that the builders do is wasted. And, and so we know that our best work is wasted without God's help. We need Him to help us. We need Him to empower us. We've got to yield to Him. And, and, and just kind of a word to workaholics, because I think we would all potentially fall into that category sometimes. You're never going to finish. A workaholic needs to hear this. You're never going to finish. So stop being so consumed by your work. Because the very thing that you think is providing for your family may very well be destroying your family. And I want you to hear this. It's tough sometimes to hear, but, but we, we work for the purpose of providing for our family, for caring for our family, becoming the dad and the, the, the mom that we need to be to make sure, obviously, that we provide food, shelter, and clothing. We want to uh, make, make our children's lives better than ours were, you know. We want them to uh, be able to do more than we did. I mean, that's kind of the, the parent's heart most of the time. And so that drives us, this motivates us to do everything we can to provide the most we can for them. And so we have this motivation of providing that leads us to work really hard. But oftentimes the hard work gets in the way of us being the dad or the mom that we're supposed to be to begin with. And so it's very possible for our uh, the means through which we hope to, to achieve the end of providing for and being a good dad and mom, we can allow the means to that end to get in the way of and become an obstacle to uh, the goal that we were, we were starting with. And so we need to make sure that we don't, we don't forget that ultimately God is the one who's working in us. And if we're making it all about our work and our achievement, if we're making it all about our goals, then we're really messing up. We've got to make sure these are God's goals for our lives, that we are, we are looking into his word and we're saying, hey, God, I, I want to be the dad that you've called me to be. I want to be the mom that you called me to be. And so we can do everything right and still f fail. We can fall short uh, if we do not allow God to lead us. And, and you know, a lot of times we, uh, we, we just say we've got to work hard. Got to do everything I can to work as hard as I can. Most world religions are built around works. And here's the deal. This is an absolute fact. They can work as hard as they want, but their work will not send them to heaven. You see, it's not about effort. It's not about working hard. You can work hard and go nowhere fast. And especially spiritually speaking. I mean, you can work hard and not achieve anything. And so this is true in individual lives. Parents or not, all of us need to hear the fact that we need to yield to God. Surrender to Him. Allow Him to work in us. It's true of our church. We need to make sure we're yielding to His purposes and not our preferences. We need to make sure that we're, we're making Him number one, that He's driving us, that He's leading us. Because spiritual success is never achieved by effort alone. There's no possible way you're going to ever be the mom that you want to be for God if you're just depending on your work to do it. And that's why people who struggle with addictions and, and you know habits and hang-ups that's why we can't beat them on our own. I mean, we try and try. How often have you ever tried to do something and you continue to fail? And you say, well, I'm going to try harder next time. You try harder, guess what? You fail. You try harder next time. You fail. Why? Because it's you doing the work. You see, eventually, at some point, we have to get to the point to where we'll surrender to God and say, God, I can't do this. I have tried unsuccessfully, continually. I recognize, I acknowledge, I can't do it without you. I acknowledge verse 1, unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. So I'm not going to work without you telling me what to do. I'm not going to try to build my own house. I want you to work through me. God, I want you to show me and empower me to accomplish that which you've called me to do. Last week we mentioned uh, a re relevant point to this. We talked about the tension of competing leaders in the home. And we talked about you know husbands and, and wives being mutually yielding to one another. And, and uh, we, we said that, you know, I used a, a picture of like a boulder down front and uh, tying a rope to it and maybe having a rope to each end and, and how a lot of married couples basically pull different directions and they go nowhere fast. And that point applies here because I want you to see that it's not about how hard you work. And, and listen, 
you could be working really hard to be godly parents. This is so real. You could be doing everything you could to be the godly husband he's leading you to be, and you could be pulling that way. And your wife doing everything she can to be the godly uh, mama that, that God's called her to be, and she's pulling this way. You're going two different ways. And these competing systems can't possibly work. And here's the application for today. Listen to this. Crazy good parents speak with one voice. So there's your application point. Crazy good parents, godly parents, speak with one voice. They're not going to be pulling two directions. They're going to be pulling the same direction, understanding that when you pull different directions, you're going nowhere fast. Hey, you may work really hard and achieve nothing. And so we have to make sure that that we're speaking with one voice. This is an issue of mutual unity. It's, it's this unity, deciding together. I'm, I'm deciding that I'm going to be unified. You're deciding you're going to be unified. You're coming together in the marital relationship. Spiritual oneness. Genesis 2, remember? The two become one. And so this is an easy concept to understand from a biblical perspective. But so many times in our marriages, so many times in our parenting strategies, we forget the common sense of you've got to both be doing the same thing. You've got to both be saying the same thing. And so we need to make sure we speak with one voice. Now, we, we have a family of seven. And a family of seven, there's, there's families bigger than ours in our church, believe it or not. I know that, you know, some people say, five kids. Um, so I think our, Jim Gaffigan, I think, is one who said, he, he does a bit on four kids. He's a comedian. And he said, what's four kids like is having, uh, being in the middle of, uh, of the, the deep end of the swimming pool and somebody hands you another child. You know, that's kind of like, and I, I think there's some relevance to that. But five kids. Sometimes we'll get in the minivan, and when we're in the... Yeah, thank you. I have a minivan, yes. Uh, so when we get in the minivan, sometimes um, Mama mainly is the singer of the family. There's others in there that love singing. But Mama starts singing sometimes, unless we turn the radio on. And uh, when she's singing, it's, it's pretty common for somebody to hijack her song. And while she's singing it, they'll start singing it with her, but they sing it louder than her. Do you all have that problem? We call it song stealers. It's not good. It's a bad thing. And it's possible that that happens pretty frequently. But then sometimes the kids will get in the van and they'll be competing songs. Does this ever happen to y'all? Maybe we're the only singing family like this. We'll go down the road and sometimes one person will sing a song. Maybe Lexi will start singing a song or, or, or Emmy. And then the other one will start singing a completely different song. And then a third person starts singing a song. And me and Amy trying to talk. And guess what? You can't hear anything because it's competing songs. And so there's multiple songs being sung, multiple conversations being had, and, and there's only so much you can hear in that one environment. It's just too much. And, and I think this is relevant here because we see that when there's multiple songs being sung, no one hears either one. When, when there's multiple, uh, I guess, visions for the family, there's nowhere, you're not going to go anywhere. No way you can achieve the goal. If a mom and dad are singing two songs, neither one is being heard. And so you've got to get on the same page. The mom and the dad have to sing the same song. You've got to make sure that you're, you're one voice together. When mom and dad compete, both will work very hard, but neither will go anywhere. And so it's important, man. This is, this is so simple, but we miss it. We need to work together. We need to have one voice. Many couples work hard to be godly parents, but they're pulling two directions. They're singing two songs. That leads us to our second principle from the scripture in verse 2. Our trust in God brings rest to our anxieties in life. Now, where do anxieties come from? I promise you, you get in a minivan with people singing three songs, you are going to be anxious, all right? And so, practically speaking, we understand anxiety in, in um, our family. We understand stress, just the stress that comes with parenting. That happens for sure, uh, even as a grandparent. I've talked I mean, talk with grandparents before who said it was easier to be a parent than a grandparent because, you know, sometimes grandparents are, there's just this assumption, you know, that grandparents are going to just babysit and do this and take care of that. And, and, you know, sometimes that's a bigger burden than you think. And so understand anxiety in the family is an, a given. It's going to come. There's going to be stress that comes into your life. So with that in mind, we understand that, that, that um, anxiety is only going to find rest in God. Here's what Matthew 6, 25 says. Jesus tells us, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or wear. Why? Because, verse 32, God already knows what you need. The Father knows. But see, I, and I'm just going to be transparent. As a dad, 
there's a heavy weight a lot of times on dads and moms because we feel like we've got to we've got to uh, meet the need. We've got to achieve. We've we've got to bring home the bacon, if you will. We've got to provide, and and sometimes there's pressure, so much pressure in that that it it really causes us to really build this strong anxiety in our life that overcome. I mean, it just overshadows a lot of the joy. Sometimes even in the midst of wonderful celebrations, maybe a parent didn't become as happy as you think they should. It's because of the weight of the anxiety of the moment on their life. Maybe they're worrying about things that you're not worried about. That's one thing. I mean, ignorance is bliss. As a child, you don't have to worry about stuff. And, and, and sometimes a child needs to hear, don't try to grow up too fast. Be grateful for mom and dad. Because they worry about stuff you don't even know about yet. Y'all right? Mom and dad has, has, have to worry about rent. Mom and dad have to worry about the light bill. Mom and dad have to worry about, they have to be concerned about meeting your needs. The least we can do as children is be grateful for what God is doing through them. Not take them for granted. Not just go to them and say, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. But go to them and say, I love you. I appreciate all that you do for me. Make your bed up. Amen? Right, mamas? Come on. Clean your room. As unto the Lord. Amen? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I should have some mamas. Amen in that. I tell you what. But the, the reality is that we should trust God in the midst of our anxieties. We need to lean on Him. Here's the application point. Crazy parent, crazy good parents, sorry. Crazy good parents learn to trust God in consistent obedience. We've got to be consistent. Now we're going to camp on this point for just a minute because it's huge. It's a big deal. Our walk with God is all about consistency. And again, if you're not even a parent, maybe you're not a parent, maybe you're not married, you can't wiggle out of this. Because here's the deal. All of us, as Christians, have a call to walk a consistent Christian life. It's what discipleship's about. See, discipleship is discipline. It is literally spiritual disciplines. We're becoming disciplined in the faith. We're becoming a follower of Jesus. We're modeling after Him. We're following after Him. And so recognizing this, that look, inconsistency in our spiritual walk always brings anxiety. So if you say, well, what brings the anxiety we've got to trust God with? It's our inconsistency. When we, bring, when, we, when we bring inconsistency to our parenthood, what happens is it brings anxiety into our children's lives. And this may be very difficult to hear, but it's just so true. If we are inconsistent in two ways, we could be inconsistent as a unit and we could be inconsistent separately. In other words, we need to always make sure that mom and dad are one voice. We talked about that a moment ago. But we don't need to be competing with, with each other in front of the kids. Mom, when mama says something, daddy should support mama. When daddy says something, daddy, mama should support daddy. And, uh, and, and that, that may seem like all that... Preacher, yeah, whatever, that's cool. But here's a lot of our problems come from not doing that. Allowing children to lead the home instead of the parents. Allowing children, and God loves the children, amen, they're our gifts, but allowing the children to position themselves between parents and, and wedge sometimes almost unconsciously. The Lord knows. They would never want to harm the relationship between mom and dad. But children can very easily position themselves in a strategic way to, to cause mom and dad to compete with one another. I know you are saying, oh, my children are perfect, right? They've never done anything like that. But here's, here's what I want to say to, to kids. Listen, loving your mom and dad, there's no better way you can honor them than not causing them to be against each other. Okay? That's how you honor them. Don't dishonor them by, by causing them to compete or or be angry with one another. Now, preacher, how would we do that? If you go and ask mama, can you go to do this or do that? And she says no, do not go ask daddy. Amen? <laughs> I'm serious. If you ask daddy and he says no, do not go ask mama. Now, if you're like me, if you go ask daddy, what's daddy say? Go ask mama. Amen? It's simple. But the truth of the matter is when we... When we when we have one answer and we go back and we, we get another answer and we position our parents against one another, it's not productive. It's dishonoring to them and it's devastating, really, detrimental, really, 
to your growth as a child. You need to have, parents, you need to have one voice. We're in this thing together. Parental consistency. But then I would even say parents uh, really need to be consistent in their instruction. They need to stick to their punishment. There's nothing that's more detrimental to a child than for a mom or a dad to say, you have this punishment, and then to not follow through with the punishment. And uh, again, I know this can't be very popular because I observe parents. I mean, have you ever been to Walmart? Bless my heart. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's amazing. Wow. But, but sometimes you see parents and they say, if you do that one more time, I'm going to do this. If you touch that candy, I'm going to spank you. And then they touch the candy and the mom and dad don't even do anything. Now you say, preacher, are you saying that, that we should discipline our children? No. What I'm telling you is if you ain't going to do it, don't say you're going to do it. If you're not going to punish them, then don't threaten them. And if you are going to threaten them, follow through with the threat. And the reason why is because it's an issue of consistency in parenting. And because your child, you're literally, your children will get used to what you demonstrate. And if a mom and dad are against each other, then you're going to demonstrate that they can always position themselves between you and get their way. If you have demonstrated to them that when you say no, no just means maybe, <laughs> then they're going to push back every time. But if you say no and you stick to it, then no means no. If you say I'm going to ground you for three days from your phone and you give it back in 12 hours, is that, a little, is that t touchy? I don't really know. But if that happens, here's what it means, that when, when we say something, it really doesn't mean what we say. You may say, well, preacher, what's the biblical precedent for that? Matthew 5, 37. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Here's what we need to hear. Our children need consistency. Our children need to hear their parents with a decisive, consistent message. We are together. We're unified. Mom and dad are the same. The two become one flesh. We are the same. And if I say it, I promise you, I will do it. And, and that, that has to be. As a parent, we have to be consistent in our punishment. So understand, I'm not suggesting you punish a particular way. But I'm saying, if you say you're going to do it as a parent, you should do it. Even if for the very reason you're teaching your children that you mean what you say. You're consistent. You're not going to threaten them and then not, uh, not follow through with the punishment. So you have to ask yourself this question at the end of the day. What matters most to you in that moment? Because here's the deal. Sometimes we give in on punishment because of our own sacrifice. And, and I only know this from personal experience. <laughs> you can imagine with five kids. But, but sometimes we, we say things. Um, I'll just say ground. You know, you're grounded for two weeks. Have you, ever, have you ever enforced a punishment and then wished you hadn't have? Absolutely. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Um, because here's the deal, when you ground for two months or two weeks or whatever, um, it, it restricts the parent too, doesn't it? And I think a lot of times, just for instance, you can't, no electronics, young man, no electronics, because you have, you've done this or that. So no phone, no iPad, no computer, no TV. I mean, we start just rambling off stuff. And then when we realize, oh, we said we, did I, is that what I said? Is that what I said? Well, maybe, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I shouldn't have gone that far. So let's just make it a day instead of three days. Because, after all, I don't want to have to have a conversation with them tomorrow. <laughs> if, they're not, if they're not on their iPad, it's going to be like, like Emmy. So, so Dad, what you, what you do today? I mean, just, well, I went to work. What else? <laughs> You know, I mean, you, you really have to engage your children if they don't have electronic devices. And so oftentimes, if you, if you impose a punishment, you, it, it causes a restriction on yourself. And so sometimes, we cave on our punishment because of what it costs us. You may say, oh man, you know, I don't know if that's true. It, it is. So I mean, if we just evaluate our own practice, I promise you, we're guilty of it. Uh, but what matters most to you in that moment? Your child's happiness... Or maybe even your own happiness or the success of your child. Do you want your child to be successful spiritually and grow 
in admonition of the Lord? Do you want them to be a responsible Christian young man or woman? Do you want them to be discipled, to be disciplined in the ways of God? Then don't teach them to be inconsistent. We need to be consistent parents and do everything we can to say what we say, mean what we say, and I mean just follow through with, um, with your um, uh, rules and your instruction. But don't say something that you don't mean. But then third and final, our third principle, our children are gifts from God, but they are not trophies to observe. Our children are gifts from God, verse 3, but they're not trophies to observe. It goes on in verse 4 and 5 to say they're like arrows in a quiver of a man, a warrior. Wow, that's, that's phenomenal. Um, here's what we can see from this principle is that our children are not our own. I kind of misspoke in the first service, and I said, my kids are not mine. <laughs> that didn't come out right, did it? Uh, we were going to the Augusta Mall one time. Amy and I were walking into the mall, and uh, our kids have always uh, at least been born with light-colored hair. It's a totally true story. We were walking in, and they were blonde, um, and, uh, and as I think it was just Will and Jake at the time, and this woman was coming out of the mall, we were going in the mall, and she saw the kids, and she said, Oh, your children, they're beautiful, two beautiful kids. Where'd they, where'd they get the blonde hair? Where'd they get the blonde hair? And I'm thinking, you know, why do people ask questions like that? Where'd they get the blonde hair? And, um, and so I went into the story, because there's a story. I mean, when I was a kid, I was born with blonde hair. And then the older I got, my, my hair got darker. Amy's same way, born with light-colored hair. Older she got, she got darker. And so when I were brunettes, but our kids have always, you know, most of them had lighter hair until they got older. And uh, so I told her that story, and I said, you know, that's just that we, we got older, and we got, but so we were born with blonde hair. She looked at me, and she said, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so she literally was accusing my wife. Do y'all follow the accusation there? <laughs> Who does she think she is, man? So I told Amy next time, if it ever happened again, it never really did happen like that again. So I would have done it. I promise you I would have done it. If somebody came up and said, where did them kids get the blonde hair? I was just going to be, I was ready. I was going to say, <laughs> it was only one time. I, <laughs> I would have done it too, but I didn't have to. I didn't have to. So my kids are mine. But here's what I do know. Here's the deal. Our children are not our own. They belong to God. Our children are not our own. They belong to God. God has entrusted our children to us. Man, it's a blessing. I want you to think about it. We're blessed to be given the opportunity to invest in children so that they can grow up to be strong men and women of God and change this world for His glory. That's what it's about. Oh, preacher, you want them to grow up and be wealthy? I mean, I want them to support their dad when they get old. Amen? But I, but I, I, would, I would rather them have zero dollars in the bank and change the world for Jesus Christ. That is what it's about. And so as a parent, as parents, we've got to see this. Look, our children are gifts from God, but they're not trophies to observe. We don't put them up on a pedestal, on a, on a mantle, and just sit back and watch them in the future. No, man, we are pulling them out of the quiver. We're putting them in the bow, and we are shooting them at a target for God's glory. And so what, what's that look like, preacher? I mean, what, are you, what are you saying? Here's what I'm saying. Look, crazy good parents, final application, crazy good parents see themselves as investors, not possessors of God's treasure. You see, we don't possess them. God does. He has entrusted them to us. God has given us the opportunity to invest in them. This is, there's no greater potential that I have. Listen, I, I mean, I know I've, I get to speak to you guys every Sunday, and it's fantastic. I want to open up God's Word, and I hope it changes your life because there's power in the Word. If it doesn't change your life, it's not God's fault because there's power in the Word. We've got to yield to it. But I, I love the opportunity to be able to preach to you guys but my greatest potential in this world is not preaching to you every Sunday. Not even close. Not even close. My greatest potential 
for this life, to make an impact in this world, or the five kids, the five kids that God's given to me and Amy. Those five children, God has entrusted to me and Amy to pour into, to invest in, to train, to teach. Because, see, here's the deal, Miss Kathy and Miss Sunita, it's not their jobs. Brother Steve, Brother Pat, Ashley, it's not their jobs to teach your children to follow Jesus. That is a mom and a dad's job, primarily. Amen. Yes, it's true. So God help us to be the parents that are going to see our responsibilities as investors, not possessors. God has given you an opportunity to change the world. I just don't know, I, how am I going to change the world? I mean, you've got world changers in your lap. World changers at your dinner table. Invest in them. You don't just possess them. They're not just yours to possess and, and put up on a mantle and say, look, aren't they great? Aren't they pretty? Man, put them, put them in a bow and shoot them to the mission field, in the community, in the school. Train them, love them, and watch what God does as he changes the world through your children's lives. That's really what he's called us to do. Verse 4, children are like arrows in a warrior's hands. And see what it boils down to is I, I honestly don't know that we see ourselves as warriors at all. And so when we don't see ourselves as warriors, we just really become, we just become people that have fine china. You know, fine china. I never have understood fine china. You buy a china cabinet. We got a, fine, we got a china cabinet. We got my grandmother's fine china. I would, I would dare say that the china has never been eaten on in 60 years. I'm serious. Just, so they're plates constructed, built for the purpose of eating on. We have built a piece of furniture to store plates to look at. That's a, and, and think about it. I mean, how many people come in? That's a really nice plate. That's nice. <laughs> that coffee cup is something else, buddy. I tell you. Wow. Now, that's awesome. And, and see, it's so crazy, but we, it's our mentality in every aspect of our life. I mean, we, we just want to impress everybody with stuff. And, so, and we should be proud of our children. Your children ought to know you're proud of them. God forbid someone else brag on your child more than you. You need to be proud of your children. You need to love them loud. Love them loud. Love them loud. But at the same time, don't put them on a mantle. Don't put them in a china cabinet. God forbid. Let God use them. Let God use them. Make them everyday plates. Hey, maybe they're not going to be millionaires, but they'll be world changers for God's glory. We don't have, need to have this mentality of, we're possessors. No. No, we're, we're investors. We're investors. And we want to send them where God wants them to go. We want Him to use them for His glory. See, that's a parent's prayer. And I pray today, man, if there's anything in this time of commitment that we can do, it would be that we would yield ourselves to that. That I would, listen, that I would say, God, that I'm willing to say whatever the question, yes. God, Wherever you're going to send them, yes. Whatever occupation, yes. Yes. I'm not a possessor, I'm an investor. They're yours. I trust you with them. I'm not going to be anxious. <laughs> I trust you with them because they are yours. Let me pray for you. Lord, God, we love you. And I, I know that today being Mother's Day is such a special day. And uh, I, I pray that you would help us learn to be the moms and the dads you've called us to be. I, I want to be a crazy good parent. I, I, know that, I know that every mom and dad in this room want to be godly parents who raise their children right. And it's hard work, Lord. We don't get it all, all the time. But, Lord, I pray you teach us. And as we yield to you today, God, that you would give us the wisdom we need to, to make the appropriate decisions in every setting and circumstance. I just pray you'd speak to us. As we continue to bow just for a moment, you may be here today and, and you're ready to join the church. Maybe you've never been saved. Man, you're the most important person in the room. And you may say, I don't even know how to be saved. But, but if you'd say you're ready to follow Jesus, you're ready to make 
him your Lord, then I want to just challenge you. In just a moment, we're going to stand up and we're going to start singing. Don't wait till verse 2 or 3 or later, but just step out and come to me. If you'll just trust me to come to me or one of the other ministers that are down front, that's what this is, an invitation to you to come to Jesus. So if you're in need of being saved, you are the most important person in this room. But maybe you're ready to join the church, make this your church family, then you need to make that decision. But man, our, our altars ought to be filled with families today. Just saying, man, we, first of all, maybe children going to mom and dad saying, I love you, I appreciate you, and I, I want to honor you like God has called me to honor you. Maybe moms and dads just want to bring their families, no matter what it is. Let's just do business with God. Let's stand together.